Good afternoon. Welcome to another installment of Strategic Thinkers series from the Policy Insights Forum. I'm your host, Paul Tyon. Today, we're most fortunate to have Brigadier Ben Berry, retired, to discuss the ongoing war in Ukraine. His recent book, entitled Blood, Metal and Dust, How the Victory Turned into Defeat in Afghanistan and Iraq, is an important read and vital for all those interested in the two conflicts. He also authored A Cold War, Frontline Operations in Bosnia, 1995 to 1996, which was shortlisted for the British Army Book of the Year Award in 2009. He has all published in 2017, Harsh Lessons, Iraq, Afghanistan, and the Changing Character of War. To add to an already busy schedule, he is also a visiting professor of war studies at King's College, London. Good afternoon, General. Good afternoon, Paul. And I should say that when I was commanding the brigade in Canada, one third of it was from Canada. Really? Including uh, 2nd Battalion PPCL by the Lord Strathcona's horse and a Griffin squadron from the Royal Canadian Air Force. All of oh, really? which were extremely useful. Well, that's, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> I'd like to hear that. <laughs> well, let's get on to our first query. Brigadier Barry, you have been monitoring these events in Ukraine for some time. How would you assess the ongoing Ukrainian 2023 spring offensive that has continued up to this point? Well, if you look at the close battle, that is the attempts by um, the Ukrainian army to break into the Russian defensive lines, it's moving extremely slowly after a rude shock from the Battle of Orykiv and other successful Russian defensive operations. The Ukrainians seem to have um, reduced the amount of armoured vehicles they're deploying in the field and proceeded much more slowly with an emphasis on dismounted infantry and dismounted sappers clearing paths uh, through the minefield. Now, the well-reported um, Russian defensive network, which is clearly visible by civilian satellite imagery, has not been penetrated much. It's been penetrated most with the advance towards the village of Robotai. Um, but that's only a part of the story, Paul. Um, a lot of international and Western journalists are doing frontline tours, interviews with um, Ukrainian units, soldiers and officers that are doing these attacks. And the front line is also being tracked by the open source research by the Institute for the Study of War, who use satellite images and social media uh, to track the movement of, of the front line. But there's part of the offensive that is not being widely reported, and that's Ukraine's deep battle, which is designed to work over time at much greater, much greater depth. Now, we do see a certain amount of this posted on social media, particularly Russian social media, uh, when Ukraine blows something up in either Crimea or Russia that can't be hidden from public view. But there's a lot of it that's not being covered by the Western media. It's not surprising about this because, of course, the deep Ukrainian deep attack, long range guided artillery, uh, like the Excalibur shell or the HIMARS rockets, and indeed the attacks by Storm Shadow missiles and now by um, S-200 Gammon missiles in the surface-to-surface -surface role, to hit their target, they all depend on intelligence. And Ukraine isn't going to willingly div div divulge its intelligence gathering methods to Russia. Um, it's designed to put the whole Russian military system under pressure, hitting ammunition dumps and depots, uh, command and control nodes reser and reserves, and it's not being covered. Um, so this is a missing part, missing part of the commentary. Why is this important? Well, I think the Ukrainian general staff, uh, despite recent media reports, probably have a very good idea of what, the, what they're doing. And the deep battles intended to complement the close battle. And Ukraine, I think, would be planning that by stretching the Russians by sequentially and simultaneously attacking across the length of this, this front, sooner or later, something will snap and they'll create a tipping point. When that might be is very difficult to say. We've received uh, a number of uh, ground reports as well as satellite photos, and <clears throat> which have provided essential details as to the prepared Russian defensive positions that you've uh, noted. 
they've been encountered by Ukrainian forces during the last few months. As you pointed out, in the Rubatine area, Russian positions have been described as a system of interconnected trenches, dugouts, and limited underground tunnels that enable Russian forces to facilitate the movement of personnel, weaponry, and ammunition from various points along the front. These defensive have also included well-constructed anti-tank ditches, dragon's teeth, and minefields that reportedly stretch across expansive fields in front of and in between these interconnected layers of defensive positions. These defenses are heavily mined and that the Russians have incorporated narrow designated mine routes through their defensive zones, thereby facilitating Russian forces to facilitate safely various firing positions. These defenses were a result of months of Russian preparations, yet at present it is unclear if Russian forces have extended this system throughout their in-depth defensive zones further south. What, in your assessment, of these Russian defenses, and what have we learned from the Ukrainian counteroffensive experience so far? Well, I've, I've seen a lot of civilian satellite imagery um, that suggests the defenses run the full length of Russia's front line from uh, right down in the south of Kherson Oblast and indeed on the shores of Crimea, all the way up to um, the very north of Russia, Russia's front line. Um, they appear to be thickest in the area uh, where Ukraine is doing most of its at attacking, for example, towards towards Robotine. And that isn't surprising because it's the area where the Russians may be most vulnerable um, if Ukraine wants to interdict the supply lines um, that run east to west ac across that area. I think we should be cautious, though, about the limitations of satellite imagery. I mean, it clearly picks up fighting positions um, and anti-tank obstacles like ditches and dragon's teeth. What it doesn't show us is preparations that have been done inside buildings, 45 buildings. It also doesn't pick up the exact size and shape of mine, minefields, particularly now there's been heavy vegetation growth uh, since the spring. So there's an important known unknown, and that is how many mines have been laid and how big those minefields actually are. You know, there are Ukrainian claims that these minefields are miles deep. Well, let's take let's take an example. The uh, German defense at El Alamein in autumn 1942, um, Rommel had about a million mines laid in front of the German and Italian positions. And it took the British the best part of 10 days, or should I actually say 10 nights, who all the breaching operations were done under darkness. Um, and they had to clear corridors that were about five miles deep. Now, bear in mind, the British um, actually had planned and prepared for this. They trained for this. Uh, they also had artillery superiority. They had air superiority. And they also had electronic warfare su superiority. So that gives you an idea of how, how difficult it is. I think, though, um, what we've learned from the fighting so far is that if the attacker doesn't have air superiority, and also if the attacker adopts a policy of seeking to minimise their own casualties, then this is going to be difficult, slow work. Military analysts acknowledge the first line of defence is the most formidable. However, Ukrainians reportedly have managed to reach these recently. To date, there have yet to penetrate the second or approach the third line of defense, which will be the very difficult challenge in the future. Can the Ukrainian ground forces achieve this with the resources at hand? If not, what resources do the Ukrainian ground forces require to achieve this mission in an expeditious fan, uh, fashion? Well, I think it'd it be useful to, to ask ourselves how a NATO army might attempt to deal with such a problem. Uh, first, it would seek to suppress all the defenders within direct fire range of their chosen breaching site with direct fire, artillery fire and helicopter and airstrikes. Having done this, it would bring forward engineers, ideally armoured engineers, uh, to breach the minefields and obstacles using mine plows, flails and explosive, explosive hoses. Having created a practical breach, it would then bring forward tanks and mechanised or armoured infantry uh, to clear the enemy defensive positions that have not been destroyed. Now, this isn't simple. 
In fact, it's it's really challenging. I mean, I was a battle group commander in the mid nineties, and I conducted um, four, four such operations in training at the excellent uh, training facility the British Army then had in Suffield in Al Alberta. Uh, only three of those breaching operations succeed. One was a miserable failure. I also rehearsed at battle group level the British plan that they had in 1995 uh, to break the siege of Sarajevo, penetrating through Bosnian Serb defences, which included some, some minefields. Uh, in our mission rehearsal, we actually broke through the minefields, but by the end of it, we'd lost all our engineer equipment uh, and most of our engineer personnel doing so. And then finally, I've done my share of blundering into unmarked mine fields in Bosnia, which has been quite a character forming experience. Uh, but of course, at the operational level, the attacker would seek to concentrate forces at where, against where the defence is a weakness, uh, have our weakest. If it succeeded in all this, it might attempt to break through the defensive belt into the less well protected rare area of the enemy to achieve a blitzkrieg effect, rather like the Germans did in France in 1940, or indeed uh, the Israelis did after they bounced a crossing across the Suez Canal in the Yom Kippur War in 1973. Now, do the Ukrainians have sufficient resources for this? Um, it's never been clear to me that they have sufficient heavy armoured vehicles. They were very clear what they asked for, which was 300 modern heavy tanks, 700 modern infantry fighting vehicles, uh, which they started asking for around Christmas. Um, actually, when you look at what's supplied, the numbers have been supplied, but not all of those things supplied are cutting edge modern heavy equipment like Leopard 2, uh, M1 Abrams, British Challenger 2, or indeed heavily protected infantry fighting vehicles like the US Bradley and the British, British Warrior. It's also far from clear to me that they have sufficient artillery, both conventional unguided artillery and um, precision guided artillery. And it's not clear to me that they have sufficient minefield breaching equivalent equipment. Now, when you look at NATO Army's holdings of minefield breaching equipment, you know, um, armored engineer vehicles designed to cut through minefields, um, you know, NATO doesn't have too many actually. Um, and it's something NATO's probably underestimated, under underestimated the importance on and thus un underinvested in. So it's very difficult, it's challenging, and it's unsurprising that the Ukrainians are attacking in several different places at once. Um, there was quite a useful op-ed in the Wall Street Journal yesterday by retired US General Jack Keane, a man who really knows his, his stuff, where he basically said that um, in a number of unattributable briefings, various US officials have suggested that Ukraine's strategy is flawed and that they ought to concentrate all their um, assault forces in a single location. Uh, Keane produces a very um, credible argument by where, where he explains that concentrating everything in one axis might be exactly what the Russians would wish the Ukrainians to do. And I agree with Keane. Should the Ukrainians successfully penetrate the Russian defenses, what do you see as a major challenge for the Ukrainian commanders during the exploitation phase? Well, I think, um, you know, we can look again at historic examples of Blitzkrieg where this has, has been achieved. Um, if they are able to achieve a full breach and break through to open country where the defenses are much less, uh, they got hard choices to make about where they direct their forces. What are the priori priority targets? For example, uh, when the Israelis crossed the Suez Canal in 1973, initially the priority target was destroying uh, radars and surface-to-air missile sites to allow the Israeli Air Force to penetrate into, into Egypt. And then there was a big hook manoeuvre to the south, which cut off the Egyptian Third Army. Um, so deciding what to do with your breakthrough is one of the challenges. Another challenge is repelling enemy counterattacks. And a third challenge is actually sustaining this logistically. 
you may not necessarily need so much ammunition if you've broken through into the depth of the enemy position, but you're going to need a lot of fuel and spare parts. What do you see as a Russian response to a successful penetration of their defenses in Russian-occupied Donbass? Well, I think they'd um, attempt to counterattack with reserve, fo reserve forces and also attempt to establish new hasty defensive lines, including uh, the hasty laying of additional additional minefields. Uh, now, a key known unknown will be the extent to which Russia's got capable, well-motivated, well-trained reserves that can deliver the sort of counterattack uh, that a NATO army might choose to do in these, in these circumstances. Uh, one of the reasons that the Germans succeeded in 1940 um, was that the single uh, counterattacks that were administered, small scale French counterattacks, and one counterattack by an improvised British armoured brigade, were insufficiently concentrated or powerful enough uh, to actually significantly delay the, the advance. I think what we'd also see, though, is an increased barrage of long range missiles uh, against a range of Ukrainian targets, military, civilian, and economic targets. In July, a leaked German intelligence report accused the Ukrainian leadership of foregoing NATO infantry training and reverting to Cold War era Soviet style tactics. In response, Ukrainians countered emphasizing the complexity of the Russian defenses they're encountering, including comprehensive and wide ranging minefields, as well as Russian air superiority that made any tactical initiatives difficult and costly in terms of casualties and materiel. Was this a justifiable assessment by a Ukrainian ally? And if so, why? Well, of course, I'd like to see the information and the intelligence on what on which that remark is based. And of course, it appears to have been an off the record briefing by German military officials. I have to be frank here. Germany has no experience since 1945 of offensive operations on land at any scale. And you contrast uh, Germany with the US and UK, who, of course, in 91 and 2003 made major attacks on Iraq. And you can contrast it with Canada, who had some uh, very tough fighting in Kandahar province, including Operation Med Medusa. Um, it's also not clear to me that any other NATO army than the US is regularly exercising land formations at brigade level, as the US is sending 10 armoured brigade combat teams a year through its national national training centre. So, you know, I do wonder about the credibility of whichever uh, German official was reported as making these off the record remarks. The Ukrainian Air Force, described as outgunned, outnumbered and outdated, has become to many analysts and observers a symbol of Ukraine's determination to resist the Russian invasion and subsequent occupation of their territory. After much NATO hand-wringing, discussions and negotiations, Ukrainian pilots are now training on F-16 fighter jets with the intent of operationalizing them over Ukraine battlefields early next year. What do you see as the impact of this new development and what are the implications for the future? Well, the first thing is, it was a very pleasant surprise to me that the Ukrainian Air Force uh, was able to take the initial punches of the first wave of Russian uh, missile attacks, probably because it had planned and trained for dispersed operations and uh, also operations with quite a challenging electronic warfare environment. Uh, and it certainly reinforces the utility of an air force being able to um, operate from improvised, improvised sites. Um, the other thing about the Ukrainian air force is it's, it's constructed an array of air defences of considerable depth and, uh, you know, large size as well. And neither side of the war so far have been able to risk their air force, both aircraft and helicopters over enemy controlled battle space much. Um, what I'm rather surprised at is that Ukraine has not been asking for long range air to air missiles. Because what's been shooting down Ukrainian fighters that have been shot down is very long range air to air missiles fired from Russian aircraft operating, if you like, over Russia or Russia controlled uh, Ukraine. Um, 
Ukraine doesn't appear to have missiles of nearly that range. And it's very surprising uh, that it doesn't seem to have asked for missiles like the European uh, meteor missiles, which would enable Ukrainian fighters over Ukrainian controlled airspace um, to, to eliminate uh, Russian fighters and also the Russian attack helicopters that have proved such a problem in the south of Russian occupied Ukraine. Having said that, um, F-16 uh, fighters, I'm sure, will be very useful to, to the Ukrainian military. I mean, there are considerable logistic factors that apply to this, you know, building up the necessary spare parts, uh, training up the equipment, equipment maintainers. Um, as long as Ukrainian pilots that are trained on F-16 are pilots who already have combat experience, I think that that it shouldn't take too long to train them up to a to a standard where they're able to usefully contribute to to the air battle. Uh, but this is political as much as its military. It's become politically very important to President Zelensky and the Ukrainian government. Memories of previous conflicts dominate, in part, modern impressions. In particular, the hundred-hour Desert Storm campaign against Iraq in 1991 the rapid occupation of Afghanistan in 2001, as well as the expeditious invasion of Iraq proper in 2003, they appear to have played into the Western expectation that Ukraine's counteroffensive, supported by Western nations, would be expeditious and decisive. Is this perception of contemporary warfare problematic in the maintenance of long-term Western support for Ukraine in this conflict? Well, Breaching well-prepared defensive networks uh, with extensive fighting positions, multiple lines and minefields. It is a difficult, tricky problem. Um, you know, think, for example, of the Canadian Corps in 1917 and 1918 and the very successful operation on Vimy Ridge. Ridge. I walked the Vimy Ridge battlefield myself. Um, but also the offensive operations in 19, 1918, such as the uh, breaching of the former Hindenburg line. I mentioned El Alamein, but, you know, it's an inconvenient truth that between October 1944 and uh, March 1945, um, the Western armies, that the, the, you know, the Canadian, the British and the US armies that had broken out of Normandy uh, then came up against... Uh, basically the German frontier defences, the Siegfried Line. And it took them the best part of five months to breach those defences so they could cross the line, it, you know, including building up all the necessary um, logistics as well as um, the difficulties of winter, winter weather. You know, and a good example of this, which is quite rightly a significant Canadian uh, battle honour, is Operation Veritable yeah. in March 1945. You know, the controlling headquarters was the British 30 Corps. Uh, it had two armoured divisions and seven infantry divisions, which included the 2nd, 3rd and 4th Canadian Infantry Division. Indeed, during the, the you know, the heavy fighting, uh, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division earned no less than 77 um, gallantry awards, which I'm sure were all richly deserved. So I think, you know, we've we've obviously seen uh, coming out of the US media, some anonymous briefing uh, by some US officials, which represent frustration. Now, whether that's official frustration uh, by the US CDS, General Miley, um, I don't know. I mean, we've not seen such frustration uh, coming, for example, out of British or French, French, French officials. Um, but this is hard and difficult, difficult stuff. And without sort of adequate coverage of this key known unknown, the extent of the Ukrainian deep battle and the extent to which the deep battle is downgrading uh, Russian morale, uh, command and control, logistics and movement, um, it, it, it's quite a known, known unknown. Some military historians and observers have uh, suggested that the Ukrainian counteroffensive is reminiscent of the 1943 German offensive at Kursk, particularly the dif difficulty encountered by Axis forces penetrating the extensive in-depth belts of highly developed 
anti-tank ditches, entrenchments, mass mixed minefields that were well sited and were supported by effective Soviet direct and indirect fires. These defenses focused upon slow moving, uh, slowing down and, and tritting German forces. Do you think this historical experience resonates with contemporary military analysts? And what does this experience bode for future conflict? Well, I'd be, I'd be pretty confident that the, the Titanic struggle, which was the Battle of Kursk, I was, it, it, it was more of a campaign. I mean, millions of soldiers and thousands of armored vehicles were involved. I've no doubt that's taught at Russian military academies. And I have no doubt that achieving the same sort of outcome um, and constructing the same sort of defensive network uh, would have been at the back of the minds, you know, the Russian senior planners um, and their senior and middle ranking officers. But I think there is an important difference. The German attackers at Kursk didn't have drones. Uh, they didn't have the massive intelligence support that the Western allies have given them, including uh, all the Five Eyes nations. Uh, they didn't have Excalibur shells and high Mars rockets. Uh, and they didn't have um, Storm Shadow and Scout missiles. And they didn't have surplus S-200s, which had been converted to surface-to-surface -surface missiles. Um, you know, you could rerun the Battle of Kursk, but if you did rerun it, you'd want to rerun it with all these um, advanced technology weapons that Ukraine's allies has, has gifted it. Um, now, this may be a long-term indication from Ukraine that a properly prepared defence, um, manned by properly commanded and well-led troops with high morale, may be stronger than the offence, but we will see. I mean, we don't know how likely it is that a tipping point may come where if you consider the Russian defensive lines to be a series of elastic black bands, the, the combination of deep attack and attacks on multiple directions by the Ukrainians cause them to snap. Very difficult to tell when that when that might be. But I think the Ukrainians are in for it for the long term. And I think they mean to continue attacking both the close battle and the deep battle uh, for the rest of the year. The costly fight in Bakhmut consisted in part of urban warfare, close entrench fighting, and heavy indirect fires were seen by some observers as an overcommitment by Ukrainian forces in the east. A number of Ukrainian allies have argued that this has eroded the overall effectiveness of Ukrainian ground forces during the ongoing spring counteroffensive. What is your assessment of this? Well, it's very difficult to assess Paul because of course we have no independently assessed uh, casualty figures for both sides. I mean, clearly there were Western voices, again, possibly off the record briefings by various military officials that pointed out that you, by holding back much, Ukraine was submitting its defensive forces to the same iron laws of attrition that it was seeking to apply uh, to the Russian forces. But I do wonder if the defence of Bakhmut was rather like the equally tenacious uh, Russian defence of the West Bank, Bank of the Volga at Stalingrad, which helped fix uh, German forces in, pe in place. And Bakhmut became totemic for each side. So I'm not surprised to hear that Ukraine's still doing attacks in and around Bakhmut, because if nothing else, it helps fix Russian defenders and distract Russian commanders and place multiple dilemmas on them, including where they commit uh, whatever reserves they've got. There has been some discussion of the tension that existed between American advisors and Ukrainian officers as to the risk aversion of Ukrainian commanders. American advisors have pushed for a counteroffensive in the south in order to break through Russian lines and reach the Sea of Azov with the objective of severing Russia's land bridge in southern Ukraine to the Crimea, which is, as you know, a critical line of communication for Russian military operations. To do so would require concentrating on the south, requiring the redeployment of some of Ukraine's best fighting units that have been assigned to the recapture of Bakhmut. Why is Bakhmut such a focus for the Ukrainians, as it is reminiscent for many of Hitler's military and political focus on Stalingrad in 1942 and 43? Well, I think I sort of inadvertently answered that second part of your question just, just now. But 
But if you look on the map, you know, and it's there on Google Maps, uh, there's a major east-west road that runs through southern Ukraine, the M14 it's shown as, which runs through Mariupol, Melitopol, and then to uh, Kherson. Now, with Ukrainian attacks on the bridges around Crimea, uh, that logistic route is of considerable importance to interfere with the flow of logistic supplies along on that route and also potentially reinforcements. Ukraine doesn't actually have to advance to the route and park tanks on it. It can use its technology to fire on it with precision weapons. And, you know, given the range of HIMARS is 80 kilometers, about 50 miles, Ukraine doesn't have to push much further south on the direction it's pushing it. It's pushing, um, you know, including the recent capture of Robotine. It doesn't have to push much further south to actually be able to inflict considerable attrition um, on that route. I mean, I think that's a potential illustration of the the way in which the close battle and the deep battle might complement each other. And also with Ukraine um, acquiring storm shadows, also the French scalp missile, which is effective the same missile and now it's newly fielded ability to uh, use s200s as surface to surface missile um you know as ukraine forces ukrainian forces advance they should be able to bring deep fire increasing to bear on russian supply li supply lines and also you know command and control facilities uh, ammunition supplies and the logistic depots air bases and ports in Crimea and also on the eastern side of the Black Sea. I, I think the other th the other factor I haven't mentioned is Ukraine's even deeper attack into, to, into Russia. Uh, General Zelizny actually published an op-ed almost a year ago uh, on a Ukrainian website where he said in the long term, uh, Russia's sense of gravity is its sense of impunity. It sense that it can attack Ukraine without feeling any pain itself. Well, you know, the drone strikes in Russia, um, the attacks by irregular proxy forces in Belgrade, um, sabotage attacks of various, various kinds, um, and the missile strikes now, um, all of those contribute to, to uh, bring the war home to the Russian people and making it increasingly difficult for President Putin to portray an air of air of normality. Um, there's a very interesting article in the Economist uh, magazine appeared recently um, about Ukraine's drone war and its innovation to uh, build up a fleet of attack drones. I've no doubt that um, Ukraine will continue to gradually increase its attack in, attacks in Russia, possible R Russia. Um, continuously and gradually, and this is designed to have a political effect uh, as much as a military effect, and also to complement um, the close battle and the deep attacks within Russian-occupied Ukraine. Pardon me a moment. And if you want another example of the way this this complements uh, these elements complement each other. Um, the drone attacks in uh, Russia itself will inevitably be drawing Russian air defences um, away from Ukraine proper, uh, which makes it more difficult for the Russian Air Force to defend over Russian-occupied Ukraine. And also some of those air def defences have been used um, to shoot down HIMARS missiles and attempt to shoot down things like Storm Shadow missiles an S-200s, well, you know, a Russian S-300 battery can't be in several places at once, uh, nor, nor can the electronic warfare systems that the Russians have used with some success against drones attacking Moscow. I don't think all these drones are necessarily launched from Ukraine. Some of the smaller drones may well be launched by Ukrainian sabotage groups, uh, intelligence operatives or special, or special forces. Um, but it does pose both a political and military um, challenge to the Russian leadership, which, you know, supports 
the deep battle in occupied Ukraine and the close battle itself. I just have one uh, last question. Can you comment on the Russian leadership and the effectiveness of their once lauded army and the Gerasimov doctrine? Well, um, I've read quite a bit of Gerasimov's speeches that have been you know, analysed by Western analysis as the Gerasimov doctrine. Um, there was a lot, I thought, of quite persuasive stuff in there about how um, 21st century military operations are political and civilian as much as uh, military. Um, I did get a slight favor of flavor from them that Gerasimov actually thought that Western hybrid warfare against Russia, particularly in terms of fomenting so-called color revolutions, um, were the main threat. Um, but all the open source material I've, I've read suggested to me that in 2020, uh, Russia had quite good joint military doctrine, um, you know, that, that met many of the requirements for credibility of, of uh, NATO and US doctrine. I think I was lulled into a full sense of security by the apparent success of Russian operations um, in Georgia and in Ukraine in 2014 and also the success of Russian forces against um, ISIS and rebel groups in Syria. Now, in all those cases, in retrospect, they weren't up against def uh, determined defenders with high morale and with a high standard of, of training and who are agile and adaptable as the Ukrainian military has turned out to be. Um, and the initial failure of the Russian offensive, if we go back 18 months, uh, to February, March, April um, 2022, you know, seemed to demonstrate enormous over-optimism and, you know, over-centralised command and control and quite possibly uh, senior Russian people are afraid to tell hard truths to President, President Putin. Uh, Russia has adapted. It would be a mistake to think they haven't. Um, you know, if we go back to high summer last year, uh, when they shifted their main effort from the Donbass, uh, they concentrated air defences and also electronic warfare uh, systems in a way that made it very difficult for Ukraine to conduct drone operations uh, over Russian control control battle space. Um, you know, they may adapt and surprise us again. I mean, war, war is, is a two-sided contest in which both sides have a vote. And both sides' actions and reactions can um, interact in complex and unpredict unpredictable ways. And, you know, if you wanted a good example of that, which is justifiably a famous Canadian battle, uh, look no further than the opening rounds of Operation Medusa. R Russia, I, I think, you know, the current Russian leadership is determined to outlast Ukraine and its allies. And they may well be hoping on a... Um, President Trump returning to office. Uh, we we will see. Um, you know, there's a there's a lot of known unknowns, but I am sort of finally reminded um, that at the climax of the Battle of Waterloo, when things were looking really quite difficult for the um, Anglo-Dutch multinational army that was led by the Duke of Wellington, uh, one of Wellington's subordinates turned to the Duke and said, so we're receiving an awfully hard pounding from the enemy. And Wellington said, hard pounding, sir. Let's see who pounds the hardest. <laughs> well, drawing from that, I would ask uh, an addendum. From your observations as, boy, as both an experienced senior officer and respected author and military authority, how do you see this conflict playing out in the short and long term? Right. I think the way the Ukrainians would like to play it out is that they will continue crumbling away at the Russian defences um, at various places along the line. If they spot any particular weaknesses, for example, across the river in Russian-occupied Kherson, they'll exploit them. But I think they would hope that the, the offensive pressure along the front line, combined with the deep battle, which only they know, what's going you know what their plans are for the deep battle 
they'd like to think that sooner or later they'll reach a, a tipping point where Russian morale will suddenly degrade, where the ability of the Russian leadership to command their forces will degrade, where the um, logistics will degrade, and Ukraine will then be able to advance much more rapidly and possibly even uh, mount a Blitzkrieg-style breakthrough. Now, I think the Russian, sorry, the Ukrainian general staff uh, know what they know what they're doing. They've also, um, you know sounded out their major military partners, including the UK and US. Indeed, um, Admiral Radikin, the UK Chief of Defence, uh, tweeted a couple of weeks ago that he and uh, General Cavoli, the commander of the United States European Command, had a day-long round table with General Zaluzny and his staff um, somewhere just on the Polish side of the Ukrainian border. So that, I think, is the Ukrainian design for battle, as far as I can make out, even if understandably they're not sharing that in public. I think the Russian design for battle is to seek to impose as many casualties as they can uh, to slow this down and frustrate it. And I think they want to outlast Ukraine um, and its and its allies for at least the next eight, 18 months. Um it's very difficult to tell what the out, what the outcome outcome will be, um, but um, I think Ernest Hemingway once said, "Going bankrupt um, can happen very slowly, but suddenly it happens very fast." That I think is what Ukraine and its supporters are hoping will happen in Russian occupied Ukraine. Mm. Brigitte Berry, thank you on behalf of Policy Insights Forum and Samuel Sosits. I want to express our deep appreciation for your time and valuable insights into this ongoing conflict. This has been both a provocative and an inform informative discussion, and I look forward to hosting you again in the future. Thank you. Thanks, thanks very much. Um, keep up the excellent work. Oh, oh do, we'll do our best. <laughs> really pleasure, Ben. Really pleasure. <laughs>